Hey, what the fuckers? Today's episode of WTF is sponsored by Pro Flowers. Get a special deal on red roses for Valentine's Day by calling 800 PRO Flowers and mention WTF. Or go to proflowers.com and click on the microphone in the top right hand corner and type in WTF. They're nice flowers. I got some. Lock the gate! <laughs> Are we doing this? Really? Wait for it. Are we doing this? Wait for it. Pow! What the fuck? WTF. And it's also, eh, what the fuck? What's wrong with me? It's time for WTF. What the fuck? With Mark Marin. Okay, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fuck, anistas? What the fuck, Terrians? What the fuck, Colombians? What the fuck, Nicks? There you go. Whatever you want to call yourselves, welcome to the show. I am Mark Marin. This is WTF. I am back in my garage today on the show. The lovely uh, and slightly pained Dave Foley. Uh, I had a wonderful conversation with him that I'm going to share with you. A little business to get out of the way before I start. I will be at the House of Comedy in Bloomington, Minnesota at the Mall of America in the freezing cold. Uh, that's just outside Minneapolis, not far for you uh Minneapolis, what the fuckers. I'll be there the 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th. God damn it. Can I just turn my phone off? Uh, yeah. Okay, it's off. So come out to that if you want. I'd love to see you there. I have no idea what I'm getting into. I imagine I'll have uh, plenty of things to look at uh, in either an ironic way or just a sad way, but I will be at the Mall of America. Thanks for all the feedback on the uh, the now infamous Gallagher episode. I appreciate your input. I would like to open with a quote, if I could. My buddy Jack Bulware, writer up in uh, San Francisco, dug this up for me, and we were trying to figure it out. Uh, we can never remember this quote from uh, Jim Harrison, who is a genius uh, novelist. Uh, I will quote this. Quote, the danger of civilization, of course, is that you will piss away your life on nonsense. Unquote. That is from the opening sentence of the title story of Jim Harrison's collection, The Beast God Forgot to invent i've gotten a lot of feedback about the gallagher episode i've gotten feedback from from uh from the gay community saying that that they were grateful for what i pointed out i got feedback from uh the uh some black comics i know that didn't think i went far enough in terms of taking him to task about what a black comic was or is i got feedback from people who were angry about a perceived disrespect i showed toward the man and I understand all this feedback, and I welcome it. The only thing that I want to say is that, uh, look, my politics are not unclear, but I didn't come to that interview with politics. I came to ask a question about certain accusations. And I'm certainly not the political correct police or the comedy police. I certainly have friends and peers who I think are funny who do questionable material, but they own it. And I'm not saying that makes it right or wrong, but they, they do not skirt the issue of what they're putting out in the world and whether or not it has the effect that it has. Some of them do it to maintain an audience. Some of them do it to challenge uh, preconceived notions of, of stereotypes and whatnot. But my issue with Gallagher, you know, right from the beginning, and I'm, I'm not going to fester on this because I don't have any shame about it, but I did have to listen to it again and, and listen to your feedback, was that he wanted respect on his terms. And in that moment, I didn't feel that I owed him that respect. Uh, and I was more than willing to talk about whatever he wanted to talk about. And the reason I pressed him on certain issues was because I felt that they needed to be discussed uh, in light of what he does and how he presents himself and what he's doing to pander to his audience. And I know a lot of you felt bad for him. That's fine. I, I, I appreciate all the input. But uh, but just know that my emotions got invested because I'm just a person. And uh, many of you know that uh, I'm not the most grounded person in the world. And I do have uh, problems with some people. And this just sort of escalated and it escalated from the beginning. And look, I chose to put it out there for you to enjoy. I chose to put it out there for you to to take in and have the responses you've had. And I and I appreciate all the responses you've had. Moving on. Let's talk about Dave Foley. Dave Foley is a is a is a wonderful guy. I've met him a few times over the years and I ran into him in Vancouver and um, we had a long conversation about our lives and uh, about you know, our pain. And, and, and I just thought it would be great to talk to him because he's a sweet man and he's a very funny man. And uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dave Foley. All 
All right, folks, you know, Valentine's Day is coming up. I don't have a Valentine. I can find one, and I will find one, because Pro Flowers is sponsoring our show. And this is a great opportunity for you, and it's a great opportunity for us in the sense that I'm a guy. There's part of me that thinks like, oh, Valentine's Day. Oh, no. But when push comes to shove, 99% of the time, I would scramble to get some sort of bouquet. Yeah, I would scram like when I was in New York, you'd end up at the bodega or the or the Korean grocer and you're trying to find flowers that look right or that you know, might pass or or not look like you you didn't even think about it. But the truth of the matter is flowers are nice. And I've never met uh anyone who doesn't like getting flowers, man or woman. They're nice. It's a nice thing. The weird thing is in order to promote this product, they sent me some flowers. I said, "Well, let me see what I'm selling." And and I got home from the road, and there was this beautiful bouquet of 12 roses, three different colors, in a vase with a box of chocolates. And there was a moment there where I thought, like, oh, somebody loves me. Oh, wait a minute. This is for the... Okay. And But they were nice. They were really nice. And it's really easy to get them. You can get one dozen red roses plus a free vase for only twenty nine ninety nine. Now, if you're listening to me right now, there's an exclusive deal that they offer, and you can get long-stemmed roses and chocolates for $10 more. And that's what I got on my table right now. They didn't come from anybody but Pro Flowers, but I do feel a certain love for Pro Flowers right now. That's the power of flowers. And also, I want to add, there's a lot of you out there that want to support my show uh, and and don't donate or, or feel like we're just sending money if they don't get anything back. Well, here's an opportunity. If you go to proflowers.com and you click on the microphone on the top right hand corner and type in WTF, you're helping the show. That's proflowers.com. Click on the microphone and type WTF. Or you can call 1-800-PRO-Flowers and mention WTF. By doing either of those things is really the only way you can get the Red Roses uh, special that we're offering here. And I'm telling you, they're nice. Now, either you can wait till the night before, or you can scramble the day of, or you can make this call now and get these flowers delivered. And they're nice, dudes. They're nice. Ladies, whoever wants to buy flowers, it's a guaranteed Valentine's Day delivery, and they're guaranteed to stay fresh for at least seven days and pretty for seven days. That's pretty good. I mean, yeah, hopefully that that seven days will be enough to rebuild your relationship or to make your significant other know that you love them. Call 800-PRO-Flowers and mention WTF or go to proflowers.com, click on the microphone in the top right-hand corner and type in WTF. Proflowers.com, click microphone, type WTF. This is like a supplies last kind of thing, so get on it, WTFers. Help the show, help your relationship, have some nice flowers, Spread the love. Sometimes headphones help you modulate. Are they right uh -huh. there? There are headphones here. They'll, I always get very subconscious in headphones. Do you really? Yeah. I can do. I usually do the one ear. Oh, that's good. When I'm doing, yeah, one ear works. Radio or voice work. Yeah, yeah. Or, and do you, I, now voice work. You do the cartoons. You do cartoons. <laughs> I've done some cartoons. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of which cartoons did you do? I did I did uh the uh the most uh famous one would be uh, uh a bug's life. Oh yes. I I found I sound very sexy. I'm sorry. I'm a little distracted by how sexy I sound. No, it's good. That's uh, that's right. why one wears a headphone. See, right. it's it's working in a positive way. Uh, we yeah. thought you would be insecure <laughs> and now you're like, "Wow, I had no uh, idea." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. I could actually make myself come just by making that sound. Oh, you see, you don't need um, me here. Mm. In the garage at the Cat Ranch, Dave Foley. Uh, you know him from everything that he's ever done, but I didn't know that you did a Bugs Life. That was Robert Shaw, and what was the other writer's name? Did you know them? The writers? I didn't know the writer. I can't remember the writers. Bob Shaw. A long time. Bob Shaw. Yeah, and it was uh, he used to do the used second. To... It was the second Pixar film. Right. He used yeah. to do. Uh, comedy years ago and he once came up to me when i was just starting out and he was already a veteran of sorts mm -hmm. and he i'd never met him before and he said uh great stuff mark i'll let you know how it works yeah <laughs> 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 that was bob shaw mm -hmm. so dave foley i had no idea you live right downtown yes yes ever since ever since my second divorce 
See now, I, I think we should just get right into it. If we, I think we should build a little bit. I, like, I, okay, when it was built, because so something uh, happy. Well, we, we'll, we'll have to go back. To, <laughs> have to go back about five years. <laughs> well, thank God. I thought you were going to say to when I was in high school, before the dream started. <laughs> yeah, no, no, there have been a lot of happy adult years. Oh, that's good. Yeah, very few happy childhood years. Oh, good. So there was a, a, a bit in between. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That yeah, that was yeah. good. So it got better. Yeah. But childhood, were you? But what part of Canada did you come R- from? Up in, uh, mostly Toronto. Mostly. Oh, so, but that's like nice, not Winnipeg. And I'm no, not knocking Winnipeg, but you can I knock Winnipeg. I felt very abandoned there by, a, by the world. <laughs> you know what? That's the state of living in Winnipeg as well. <laughs> it is right. If you live in, Win- that's how you feel every day. I. It, it was just brutal. Everyone in, a way. in Winnipeg thinks they're the only person living in Winnipeg. I think. So yeah. either I guess you can look yeah. at that as special or sad. Yeah. Kevin McDonald lives in Winnipeg from Kids in the Hall. He still lives there. He's living there. Yeah, he he moved there recently. He fell in love and and uh, has moved there. And you got to be really and, in love, yeah, to move back to Winnipeg. I was wondering because he was. I did the festival up there a couple years ago, and he was there. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, 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 working at a booth. No, I'm kidding. He would, <laughs> <laughs> no, he appeared, and I thought, well, that's great that he's up here, and it turns out he lives there. Yeah, and he's happy there. Yeah, well, that's he, he met he met this girl up there, and uh, when he was when he was doing the festival one year, so he's just he's pretty much stayed there. Now, do you guys are you guys all pretty friendly? Uh, yeah, we are actually more friendly now than I think maybe than than we've been since like the eighties. Now, when somebody like Kevin meets a woman, given your history with that uh, gender, mm-hmm. do you say like, oh, um, hmm? Well, actually, this is a case where this is actually the first woman that Kevin's ever been with that actually likes him. Hmm. And he's one of those guys. Huh? Yeah, he likes he, to fight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and no, he likes to give in. Oh, he likes to lose. <laughs> That's what he likes to do. But I mean, fighting uh, for the affection of someone who doesn't like you seems like a yeah a chore. No, well, he, I don't think he really fights, but it just falls into his lap and he just takes it. You know, it's like <laughs> you know, it's like I hear I have a plan. Yeah. wherein I abuse you emotionally for the next ten years. Yeah. And what you get out of this yeah. uh, is of no concern to me. This is that's the, that's that's the, the offer. Day, that's the Dave Foley plan. No, that's the Kevin McDonald oh, plan. That's wow. how Kevin's relationship started. I, I th- uh, oh, the, so but the woman is the abuser. In Kevin's, yes. right. So with yeah. me, it'd be the flip side. Yeah, yeah. yeah where yeah. Uh, that's how I enter a relationship. <laughs> yeah. But but we had this bonding thing. You and I we were in Vancouver, and it was like you know, like when you've been divorced twice or you've gone through a bad divorce. You- <laughs> You kind of remember you're you're a member of the Heavy Heart Club, yeah. You know, like you, you know, you sort of like you exude it, you know. And I like right when I saw him, I'm like, yeah, and me too. Oh I know. God! And when people who aren't in the club want to tell you their problems, like, it's yeah. just you, you know, yeah, you're no. not in this league. <laughs> yeah. You can't begin I'm unless a, you unless I'm, you're terminally ill. Yeah, you cannot trump me. Can't compete unless yeah. there's terminal illness somewhere in the circle of your problems. No, yeah. I am in a ongoing, you know, financially draining, emotionally deadening process. <laughs> yes, that I don't see a way out of. <laughs> yeah, no. no. Now, now, are you able to draw from that uh, experience for your material? I thing? think so. I don't know. Well, here's the um, which I think I think the appropriate response to this, and I'm going to predict what your response will be, mm. is one of deep sadness. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've started doing stand up. <laughs> yeah. No, no <laughs> the, I mean, I the feel, frozen, I'm, the frozen attempt at enthusiasm. On your no, face I am happy about precious. that. Why would I begrudge you the opportunity to fully experience pain as a solo <laughs> performer? I know, but also going into it as a middle-aged man, uh, I've a lot. I had a lot of trepidation about it, just cause, just because most, because so many of my friends, yeah, are so skilled at it and have been honing it for their entire lives. And it just seems something shitty about just going, you know what? I'm famous. I can probably get gigs. Well, well is that your incentive? <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> well, then then it is dubious. Yeah. Oh, I, of course it is. No, I thought you were saying, like, you know, finally I can, you know, really process my emotions and feelings uh, in front of a room I, full of strangers with no protection. N- uh, that would be a lovely way to put it. It would be a lie. <laughs> Um, the motivation is entirely, uh, court ordered. Uh, really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So have you, have you started booking stand up gigs? I've just been doing like, like sets around downtown and you I just show, show up at like these places where the, the comic run shows type of place. Yeah. You've been doing those just to like develop material. Now, I just started just before Christmas. And, and how is it going? 
and it's going all right. I've been enjoying it. Yeah. I actually have been enjoying it. And what do you what are you talking and about? Talking about well, talking about things like my first marriage. Really? And talking about a you know, bunch of things. Uh, a lot of it seems dirty when I think about it, which I guess makes sense because most of the kids in the hall stuff is pretty dirty. Uh huh. Now, are you finding that you're dis? Because like when I think of watching kids in the hall, when I was a you know when I was you know work it's certainly at Comedy Central, I used to watch it constantly because I'd run clips from it. That uh, there was always sort of a buoyant kind of you know chipper but you know sardonic element that you had. But now, like I have to assume that the buoyancy is. Has been the, d- <laughs> diminished. And, it and, is. It is. Uh, yeah. I'm my my. Yeah, the water line's a little higher on my body. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, just, it's just you kind of going. Oh, yeah, keep, yeah. Yeah. Keep, just keep my head up. Yeah. <laughs> Lean back. Yeah. Please be careful of your wake <laughs> as you pass. That's all I'm concerned about. Is please be conscious of your wake, people. Have you had any train wrecks on stage? Or no, not yet. No, I, I, as I said, I've mostly been going up, and it's been fairly loose so far. Because I'm still just like figure, developing. Do you knock a few back material. before you? Uh... Uh, I usually have a beer. Oh, just a beer. Or, yeah, I usually have a beer. Mm-hmm. Sometimes two. Uh huh. That's before. it. Before, because uh, I'm anticipating yeah. the possibility of uh, you touring as a solo act. Yeah, and there are a couple of nights where you're just like, I can't do it, and you like. <laughs> You drink too much, and then we get some great YouTube of uh, Dave Foley losing it that in is, Kansas City. I'm going to say that is almost inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> if I know anything about me. <laughs> oh, you know, that, so look forward to And those. my coping mechanisms. Oh, that's great. You're going to go out there on your own, right? Mm-hmm. Just travel like we do. Like, yeah, you know, that's you the plan. Figure out, get your carry-on together. Yeah. Fly and, in. Uh, yes, travel as you know, cheaply as possible. Make as much money as possible. Uh, you, you, and to fill the bag up with. To fill the bag. Yeah, because, yeah. So now, are you planning on doing comedy clubs? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. you really yeah. doing it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. You know, hopefully I'll, you know, as I said, the, uh, you know, what I was told by some other people, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they're saying, well, if you know, if you're if you have some recognition, yeah, you can go out if you can put an act together. You can go out and you know you can get good gigs. Yeah, you know so, right. What does you know, that mean? Like, uh, like yeah. you know, that pay money that make right. it worth your while showing right. up. Right. You know? Well, you can, I think you got one good, you know, maybe a year run of that. Yeah, and I would save the uh, the the drunken, you know, uh, sort of weird, <laughs> you know, despairing sets for later in the run. Bro, I thought those would, that'd be how I'd warm up. <laughs> Let it just start. <laughs> so then, what happens is like you know, if yeah. you see Foley's doing stand up now, yeah. and it's fucking, it's 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 yeah. chaos. Yeah, I want. Well, my hope is that the tour will be sponsored by Suicide Watch. Oh god, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> <you know. laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, they'll have placards up. Yeah, maybe they can like suggest it to people that call the hotline. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm thinking about killing myself. Wait, we'll give you two tickets to see Dave Foley <laughs> if you buy drinks. <laughs> yeah, good. All right. Well, I'm glad there's a plan in place. So let's look back into the good years oh, and then get right. back to this okay now when we were so you, you grew up in toronto which is a, a fairly sophisticated and 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 quite pleasant canadian city it is yes and uh the childhood was what shitty because well it was um you know part we, we moved constantly I, my dad was a, a steam fitter uh, I don't even know what that is. That's a, I guess it's also called a pipe fitter. It's like oh, right. industrial plumbing. Sure, you sure. You do like, you know, the pipe yeah. work for right. like, nuclear power plants, Holy that sort shit. of thing. So he's the guy with the hard hat going, just turn it out, bring it around. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's the chronic alcoholic who was <laughs> in charge of making sure that the nuclear rods were properly <laughs> kept underwater. <laughs> <laughs> That's reassuring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He would be up at four in the morning having his his glass of VO and his yeah. smoke <laughs> yeah. before going to work. And, you gotta uh, take the edge off, you know. Oh yeah. yeah. Sleeping's hard on people. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then he came home and what? And then he would come home and mostly brood. He yeah. was uh like a deeply depressed guy. Not a yeller though. Oh, not a yeller, and he, no, he would inspire everyone else to yell. Oh, just to get his, through to him, with just his dark, <laughs> and oh. you're just like so mean. Oh, really? You're just like yelling at him, like you know, just, come on, snap fucking, out of you're it! You're a fucking horrible father. <laughs> oh, good, you know yeah. that kind of yelling. When did that start? Uh, I can't remember. Uh, I'm assuming uh, for me, probably around uh, ten. Oh yeah, I think around ten. You got 10, siblings. Uh, yeah, I got like uh, an older brother, a younger brother, and an older sister. Oh, man, it's a lot of you. Yeah, yeah. Was it your job, like with me, because my dad was manic depressive, I, it was sort of on me to entertain him. Did you? Uh, yeah, I, well, I thought I did. Yeah. I, 
know? I thought he was pleased by my by my because uh, he he my dad was like a pipe fitter who fancied himself as uh, as a working class intellectual. You know, he wanted to be he wanted to be Jack Kerouac. Oh, and looked a lot like Jack Kerouac. Oh, really? And had the same drunken sibilance of Jack Kerouac towards the end of his life. <laughs> really uh, disowned you know, his. Sloss, 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 sloss. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. like no matter how yeah. sober they are, it's all bullshit. You know, the S's stop working. <laughs> You know, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so they need a translator of some kind. Yeah. So did he write? Uh, he, when he was a young man, he wrote a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And apparently, my mom says that at some point, when he was in his twenties, he took everything he wrote and threw them into the furnace, and yeah. you know, and never wrote again. Right. Did he uh, talk about that day? He never did. Uh, no. But your mom did. Yeah. The, the disappointment. Yeah. I think it was no. The, <laughs> it was just the day. And then after that, he was an even bigger asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but she stayed with him the whole time. She's English. She <laughs> lived through the she lived through the Blitzkrieg. <laughs> this was nothing. No, what yeah. does she know? We can stay above ground on this one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> only only I can hear the sirens. Yeah, English uh, English working class people because because uh, because uh, you know the the English the with the educated class of English yeah. are very different from the working class English. Well, they try to maintain that. I mean, they they enforce that difference. Yes, don't they? yes, <laughs> all of the rage. That's what the working class people get, rage. Uh -huh. All that rage that the rich people don't express, yeah. that they express by saying, oh my. <laughs> That that suppression of rage, yeah, all gets it just gets it just filters down. Right, the suppression of rage yeah. goes right into the hearts and souls of the working class, yeah. and then it's spewed and at the upper class, it, and the upper yeah. class goes, "Oh, what is the?" Commotion? That's how, yeah, you, yeah, you want you want to pint? What the fuck? Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. you know, everything is a a potential fight with the British working class, <laughs> and yeah. that's your mom comes from that. Yeah, she comes from that. She comes from like a nice Midlands town, but but that's you know that that you know it's not uh, you know it's they. She, what she does have that the wealthy have as well was a complete inability to express emotion. Oh, good. Other than anger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if she had that? Yeah, she could do that. But she couldn't tell you that she loved you, that she was incapable of that, you know. So dad's brooding. Mom's... And my, and my, and whereas my dad would hug and, you know, he would like every six oh, months yeah. want to hug and cry and yeah. talk about, uh, I know I'm a bad father. Oh, God. That's, oh, the worst. that's when, great. When they, they decide to mm. hug you and in your ear they go, I don't want to live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't want to have any kids. <laughs> I didn't want to. I didn't expect to live this long. <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but I did. Uh, I know I'm a bad father. Oh, it's such a horrible position and to it's be. Like, well, I know you're a bad father too. Yeah, this right. conversation's kind of redundant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's try you know. to have some smiles. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's put Rockford Files back on. <laughs> That's when we're happy. Oh no! Uh, so then we're we're just in the kitchen, and, and you said you were working on. What so you working on a paper on Lenny Bruce in your senior year of high school that you never finished? I did. I never did finish it. That's what I see. I, I didn't realize in high school. Uh, Sorry if it gets hot. In here. No, that's right. Uh, yeah, it's gonna get hot. I know. You get ready for it. I, I don't know why I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dave uh, Foley's gonna turn it up yeah. in just a second. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get old Kinnison in here. Yeah, <laughs> fuck yeah, man. Wait till you go on the road. And you got to do morning radio. <laughs> oh, oh, that's. Oh, oh. I've done a lot of that. Oh, you have. Oh, touring with the kids. Oh, oh okay. Lord. Yeah. yeah, that must have been quite something because I yeah. picture that you and McKenny were probably not great in the morning. Uh, I'm not, uh, McKinney, I'm trying to think what part of the day McKinney is great in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I haven't seen him in a long time. He's an oddball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is. He really is. I, you know, I know his brother Nick pretty well. He's, he's very sweet. Seems like a fairly, uh, you know, functional person. But the times I've met Mark, I'm like, what is going on in there? <laughs> yeah, Mark is definitely. He, we always say he was sort of like, you know, uh, what we always hear Peter Sellers was like. In oh, one really? Is that there's like no real Mark? Oh, right. You know, right. Mark's always in a persona. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's, yeah. And beneath the persona is just a weird series of reactions and yeah, problems. Yeah. Which is odd because the rest of the kids in the hall are so together. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I know you. I've met Kevin. He seems like a very nice guy. Mm. Probably the, the more codependent of the bunch. Yeah. And then yeah. I don't know the, uh, uh, Brian? Bruce. Bruce, Bruce yeah. yeah. I don't know him at all. He's the little man. Yeah. Uh, so he's got that. He seems like he's kind of together, no? He's very together in a lot of ways, yeah. Yeah. But he's also very, I mean, everyone, I'd say everyone in the group is pretty fucked up. Uh huh. You know, very, uh, in their own, in their own special way. I know Scott, and he's apparently gay. Yes, and yeah. that will not go away. <laughs> We hoped that the chemo would take that out, uh, but no. He's a very sweet guy. You get along with him? Oh, I love. I get along with all of them. That's amazing. Well, that in yeah. and of itself is an amazing thing. Yeah, I mean, we actually are all right. 
probably now closer than we've ever been as a group. Yeah. You know, for, now that uh, it's over and it's all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all nostalgia and looking back on good times. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even like recently we did the Death Comes to Town, a miniseries. No, and, and it was like we working together. We still fought. Right. But it was like the fights were manageable. It was not life threatening and someone wasn't going, I'm going to make a movie. No. And yeah. often the fights were about work. Uh, oh really? They were yeah. They, they were specific. Were, they weren't. They, were, uh, they, no. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't just. Well, you could do your joke, but you're an asshole. <laughs> None of and that. that. No, no. It was just you know that yeah, joke yeah, is yeah, shitty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead. But the interest in comedy, you know, started like how did it happen? Um, which? Well, I mean, you were in high school. If you're writing a paper oh, like, on Lenny oh, Bruce, was, something must have. Well, I was deciding. I had decided well, when I was in high school. Somebody suggested to me that I should do become stand up. Mm -hmm. And I actually did for a little while. When I was like seventeen, I started doing stand up. And and you know, and I I'd all, my I'd always thought I was going to be a writer was my plan. Uh, so I thought, all right, well, I got to figure out how to write stand up. So I started studying it. A TV writer? Uh, I know. I wanted to. I probably. I, I think I wanted to write short stories. Maybe. Uh -huh. Maybe even a writer. A novel, writer. You yeah. Know, sure. Comic novels. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, like Terry Southern or somebody. Or? I guess. Yeah. To me, I, that's how I think I wanted to be more. Uh, uh, I, either the new Thorn Smith, who nobody remembers, right? Uh, who wrote like Topper and Turnabout, uh huh? Um, or I, or Mark I, Twain, perhaps? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or um, uh, jo uh, Joseph Heller was one of my favorite oh, yeah, writers as yeah. a kid. Yeah, so so kind of fun, dark comedy, but literary. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I thought I would do. Yeah. But that, then I, gradually, as I got into actually doing comedy, I realized I wasn't that good a writer. Mm -hmm. Um. I was good enough for television, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I was. So I started studying comedy, started getting old comedy albums, and I thought, well, if I'm, you know, if the best thing to study would be Lenny Bruce. So I uh, started researching to write a paper about him in high school. Yeah. But uh, the thing I didn't realize at the time was that I was severely dyslexic. Really? Um, I mean, I knew I couldn't read. I'd spend my whole school life hiding the fact that i couldn't read yeah you know or that i, I could read but like at an incredibly slow rate how did you get out of that in school um i mean reading out loud didn't they call on you i could do Dave, i, could, could, I you... could do reading out loud oddly enough uh-huh reading out loud which i can do now i can sit at a table read and read a script right and you know but if i try to read the same script at home it takes me like five times as long huh like if i'm not reading it out loud it takes me five times as long that's wild and uh, and if you read out loud everywhere you go, yeah. people think you're crazy. Yeah, yeah. And you uh, can't just go. No, I've got a problem. With <laughs> yeah, not, not the out loud. Yeah. Oh, fuck it, I can't. My brain processes spoken speech differently than it processes <laughs> written words. If I say them out loud, my brain processes it faster. Does that explain it? <laughs> yeah. Thanks for clearing that up on the bus. Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, you know, so I, I had spent my whole like I used to like I'd be reading a book and about the time that if anyone would notice that I was reading the same book after two weeks, yeah, I'd stop reading it. <laughs> So I have I have I have read uh, a third of some of the greatest literature in the world. Well, if it'll if it's any comfort to you, uh, you know I don't have dyslexia. I'm in the same boat. Look around; all these books are you know most of them are maybe a third read, yeah, or perhaps even the first fifteen twenty yes. pages. All of my books are in storage, yeah, so they no longer live with that horrible misapprehension that I might read them one day. <laughs> they just think, they just comfortably in boxes going oh. All right. Okay. Pressure's He's, off. I can just relax. <laughs> I don't have to think. Oh, today's the day. He's going to read me. He's finally going to read. He bought me six months ago. He hasn't looked at me. Yeah. And he's going. Oh fuck. He's had me uh, twenty years. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I'm glad you let your books off the hook. Yeah, that's important. You don't want to. <laughs> yeah, because you know. it's a lot of pressure on that. You now you're making me feel bad for my books. I know. Well, I'm trying to do the same for my children now. <laughs> How old are they? Uh, I have well, I have three children. I have two kids from my first uh, and truly horrible marriage. Yeah, uh, and um, they're eighteen and fifteen. So they're kind of off the hook in a way. No, not in Canada. No, no. no. <laughs> oh, you mean money wise? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't have to care about them yeah. as much. <laughs> but I, oh, you know, no. but their but their cost hasn't gone down at all. When does that stop? Uh, Twenty two if they stay in school. Wow. Although my uh, my first wife believes that she's got an angle whereby it can last forever. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Wait, she's just going to keep them not finishing school? or Well, I think her her hope is to, uh, I think, like blunt their mental capacities <laughs> in some way so that they are never capable to take care of taking care of themselves. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because that way she can keep making a dollar off of That's them. That's a hell of a hell of an approach. She's a great mom. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Do you like these kids? I love them. Yeah. I love them. Do you get along with them? 
I, I do most of the time. There yeah. are times when I have uh, uh, incredible contempt for them. <laughs> You know? I think that's normal. Yeah. Like Do you show parents. that contempt? Uh, very rarely. Well, that's good. So you got that very, from your mom. Very you rarely. You stifle the feelings. I stifle all my... <laughs> and because you don't live with them directly, it doesn't yeah. have to just be anger. Yeah. No, I see. I think I'm more the other. I'm, I'm, I'm much... I guess... I think I have... Um, I, I have more of my dad's hugginess, uh -huh. but without the horrible brooding blackness. Right. The suction to the hug. Yeah. yeah, there's no yeah. vacuum, emotional yeah. vacuum yes. involved. The yes. hug is not a taking hug. Yes, it's not. It's, 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 they don't come out of it five pounds lighter <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> because of their joy being <laughs> supplanted. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's growth. That's good. Yeah. You've changed the family uh, history. Yeah. So, so you're right, you're in the middle of a Lenny Bruce paper, and and what happens? You decide high school's not I for you. I can't research. That's the thing. Oh. I realized I can't research. I've, I've, so I'm working on re researching this paper for yeah. a year. Yeah. And so I've got photocopies that I've taken from microfiches. Mm. Um, God, remember that shit. Yeah. That uh, I think that stopped me from writing a lot of papers. Oh yeah, just the I, idea that you had to go find it in the file and then put in it in a light, projector and, and then drive downtown, go to the main, the central oh, library. I'm tired and, just hearing about I it. I know. And uh, but so I had all of this research and it was fun doing because I, you know, read like like local reviews from all over North America. So you learned like, a lot about Lenny Bruce, yeah. despite the fact that you couldn't write the paper. If I was smart enough, I probably could have written a, a good book about him. Sure. Um, but I couldn't write the paper, so I. I eventually just looked at the stack, I, all this research I had done that I couldn't read. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Some things I'm going, all right, I got all this, but I can't read it. Wow. And I just sort of admitted to myself, I can't read this. Yeah. And, and I've tried, I tried taking like a speed reading course yeah. in school. And uh, no one had treated, no one had diagnosed you with dyslexia? No, because I, I hid it really well. Because I would, you know, in te like standardized tests, I would. I would read like maybe a quarter of the of the text that you're yeah. supposed to read and answer questions right. on, and I'd be able to guess at the answers. You know, I was, uh, you know, I, you know, for better or worse, I was smart. Right. Uh, so I, because I was smart, I was able to hide the fact that I was horribly impaired. Now, now, did you know? Was it diagnosed eventually? I mean, were you able to say that's why? Only, well, when I when I finished school and got out, and then I my my first wife was dyslexic, and she started going through all the diagnosis that you know the the symptoms of dyslexia and what right. it is. And I had like like nine out of ten symptoms of dyslexia, you know. And it was like just clear. All right, that's obviously. And then is there anything is. you can do? There really isn't anything anyone can do for dyslexia. All yeah. you can do is for is have coping mechanisms. Okay. You know, ha ways to get around it. You know, like yeah. They, sure. Now they let kids you know write tests on computers and they give them extra time. Oh, so but, at least they can engage their intellect and not feel. Yeah, they just right. yeah they now they acknowledge it and they treat it and you know they don't treat it but they give you uh, ways to cope and my way of you know and you know way of coping was to become very verbal yeah and to learn through listening and to you know learn I learned a lot from television mm -hmm. um, and then you were on television and then I yes I watched enough yeah and I believe this is how it works yeah <laughs> if you just watch enough kids <laughs> if you just dedicate yourself you get up early yeah. And you start watching TV, and you don't stop yeah. until you are nauseous. <laughs> yeah. They will give you your own TV show. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so you drop out of high school, and that's when you met the rest of the guys, or did you know each other? How'd that work? Uh, yeah, I met them. I, well, I'd, I'd started doing stand-up. So you were going to Yuck Yucks. I was Yuck doing Yuck doing stand-up. In uh, Toronto. I just did Toronto. that club. Yeah. And I was, um, uh, you know, like, just open mic stand-up. Yeah. Know? And uh, and then I thought, then... Uh, it was just like that I sh should take an improv course to. I thought it would help with you know stand up because mm -hmm. it was all well. Lenny Bruce did a lot of improv, so you're really on this Lenny Bruce thing. Oh I yeah, mean, I, was, I wanted so much to be. I was like a 17 year old Lenny Bruce. Were you doing like social commentary? I was saying and... things like Dig Man. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, yeah, <laughs> you, you know? got it. Yeah, and what you gotta understand? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know? Were you speaking in Yiddish occasionally? Yeah, occasionally throwing in Yiddish, <laughs> calling things dopey. Yeah, because yeah. he said dopey all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, uh -huh. um, so yeah, I was trying so hard to be a, a seventeen-year-old, yeah, the, you know, Canadian Lenny satirist. Bruce, yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, which is really precocious. Yeah, um, yeah, must have been great. Yeah, oh, yeah. any tape of that available? <laughs> I there, you know, there is actually. No, uh, I don't know. If I've never, I have never seen it. But I, when I was uh, eighteen, I think, or maybe just after I turned nineteen, I got flown to L.A. Mm. There was this Canadian show called uh, the Thrill of a Lifetime. Yeah. Or sort of a game show. It's supposed to be people write in their, what they, be their Thrill of a Lifetime, and they, they make it come true. Yeah. Uh, but what they really did was, 
they had a they were produced by the same people that produced Evening at the Improv. Uh huh. So they decide so they went out and did a casting call for unknown comics. Yeah. Um uh, and uh had everyone audition to pretend that they had written a letter saying this was their thrill of a lifetime oh, to be to perform at the Improv. Lie. Yeah. So I won that. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. uh so I got to fly to um to LA and I got to perform in between two episodes of Evening at the Improv. Yeah. I was in between uh, Tony Curtis sure. hosted the early show, yeah, and Guido Sarducci hosted the uh, the late show, uh-huh. you know. And, and so it was a pretty amazing experience at, at that time. Yeah, I, how you old were you? Eighteen? I think I was like eighteen or nineteen. That's great. Yeah, or I just and you met 19. Bud Friedman with his weird M- monocle. Met and... Bud Friedman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, met Willie Tyler. Hmm. Willie Tyler and Lester. Sure. I have a, a an autograph uh, from Willie Tyler and Lester. Is he still alive? I, I think wonder. he is. You Sorry, know. those headphones slip on and off. That's all right. It's because right I'm doing the hipster one ear thing. Yeah, it's uh, and you're pulling it off. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you fly out and you do that. And yeah, it, it goes well or no? It does go well. I actually do really well. I I, I think I only bombed once and all the time I was doing stand up when I was a teenager. So what are you worried about now? It's going to come right back. It's like yeah. riding a bike. I'm not worried about bombing so much. I'm just worried about the sadness of actually doing it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, while you're up there, the sadness coming out. No, that's just the sadness of the decision to do it, and oh, the sadness, and the sadness of my friends who well, are all comedians. Well, going, how, well, Why are you doing? Well, this? how they feel about the poker show? I mean, come on. I mean, sad. This, but this it, is a step sad up. About that. <laughs> is, I mean, this is the right direction. <laughs> yeah, the poker show paid well. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> but I, I have nothing against it. I'm just curious. Mm-hmm. Wait, we're talking about the good times. So, All right, the good times. So you come back from Hollywood, and you're taking improv classes and I, in And I've been taking improv. And it was, you know, at that point, I had actually, I got digressed, because by that point, I had started working with Kevin McDonald from the kids, and a guy named Luch Casimiri. We formed the original three-man improv team. And it was improv, it wasn't sketch? It was improv at that point, mostly. We, yeah. were, uh, we met doing Second City workshops. Uh-huh. Uh, Kevin and I actually got... We got paired up randomly in my first class at Second City. Mm-hmm. The teacher just sort of went to you, 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 and you, and I got paired with Kevin. And uh, and by the end of that class, he asked me to join his uh, improv team at Theater Sports. Oh, that's good. Um, so then I started doing uh, improv, and then pretty much immediately stopped doing stand up. What's well, why it's less of a it's burden, you know. You can yeah, just kind of hang out with other people. Yeah, it was fun on stage. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And uh, I mean, I think I sort of overlapped sit around, a little bit. Sit around all day wondering what the fuck. Oh god. <laughs> yeah. And then I've, I've got eight minutes. Yeah. Fucking, that weird love hate you have with like doing the I fucking know. eight minutes. And my dream, because up to that point, my dream was I thought my dream was that if I worked really hard, I can get up to I I'm told I can get up to a level where maybe I can make like five thousand dollars a month. <laughs> yeah. Oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I was making like seventy five dollars a gig, and I thought that was great. Yeah. If I can just do four of those a week. Yeah. I thought I'll be a professional comedian. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So that's what I was. Uh, and then improv came, and it was like, thank God. Yeah. It was just more fun, and it suited me better because yeah, my you know my. I guess my comic, my humor, I guess, comes out more conversationally. Right. And I never, I had, I never had, I didn't really master the fake conversation. Yeah. Of stand up. Yeah. You know, like just you, talking. Where you make it seem like you're having a conversation, sure. but nobody else is talking. Wow, I never even thought of that. You know, yeah. that probably just ruined your stand up. Right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I'm all fucked up now. Yeah. God damn it, Foley. I, but, I thought you weren't. You, you sucked me down into your misery. <laughs> yeah, but I'm starting to learn how to do that. I'm yeah. like, now I think I can. I'm I'm doing that. Uh, nat. It feels well, more natural. On well, you're stage. supposed to be buoyed by laughter. Yes. The, you know the conversation yes. has a. You know it's like ah, oh, there they are. Yeah. Yes. And don't be. They'll talk to you if you engage them. Yes, I, that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. you do. <laughs> no, no, they don't. No. I actually don't mind people talking. No, no, I don't either. If it's yeah. friendly. Yeah. 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 But, so, um, so how did it evolve into the group? Well, we were uh, doing theater sports, and then we started writing stuff and doing shows outside, you know, on our own. And then uh, we heard about this other group from Calgary that was doing theater sports out there, and everyone said, was "Well, they were a lot like you guys, you know." Oh uh, shit! Was it like who they are? Who are those fuckers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, well, everyone said, "Well, everyone thought, you know, when we heard they were going to move to town, everyone thought there's going to be this big competition between these two groups that were yeah. both because, like, we were kind of like." Audiences really liked us, but the people running the theater hated us. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And who uh, was in the other group? The other group was uh, Mark and Bruce were in the other group, right? Along with uh, guys who later went, came in and wrote with us, guys uh, um, like Norm Hiscock, and who went on. He was like one of the producers of yeah. King of the Hill. He yeah. works at 
Parks and Recreation now. Gary Campbell, uh-huh. uh, and Frank Van Keeken. Uh-huh. Uh, they were all in the group, too. Um, but uh, So they all moved out, and we, we were booked on the same midnight show once, and we kind of did the show and but at the end of that show we, the two groups merged we just oh really said, yeah yeah the show we just all said we should do stuff together <laughs> you know? right you know so yeah. yeah yeah that seems like a good idea we should do stuff together and what year is this like this is 85? like five oh no this is uh i think this is like 82 uh-huh i think 82 80 maybe 80 Probably like eighty two or eighty three. Uh huh. Kevin's the one in charge of knowing dates. Oh, okay. Uh, but we I need think to that'd be about or... right. Eighty two or eighty three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have a thought his phone <laughs> and answer. Um, yeah. So we started doing gigs as a, a big eight man group, and then um, Luch quit from our side, and a couple of guys quit from their side, and and then eventually we, Scott Thompson forced himself into the group. <laughs> uh, How did that play? He out? just stopped. He just kept showing up. <laughs> Um, and, and, and McKinney really liked Scott. Scott, He he thought Scott was really funny. Kevin and I thought he was horrible. Yeah. I mean, we liked him as a guy, but we thought as a comedian, he was just awful. Why? (laughs) Because he was an actor. (laughs) Yeah. He studied acting. Oh, right, right, right. Oh, he's going to come on our stage and act all over it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, It's going to be horrible. (laughs) Was he, was he annoying? (laughs) Well, you know, we just hated actors. You're right, right, right. (laughs) Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so he, but he joined and eventually Kevin and I warmed up to him. And then yeah. you just started working together. And when did you change the name to uh, just the, you know, the? Uh, it was a little while. It was because Kevin and I were in a group called the Kids in the Hall. Okay. And the other guys were in a group called the Audience. And then, at one point, you know, a bunch of people had quit, and we were, we said, you know, to get some shows up again. And uh, at that point, there were more Kids in the Hall in the group than audience members. Oh, so it was a democratic decision. Yeah, it and a, and and at that time, majority rule decision. Kevin. Uh, and Mark McKinney and myself were doing a radio show uh, for Ryer- Ryerson University uh, under the name Kids in the Hall. Uh-huh. So we said, well, we can cross-promote. Yeah, yeah. You know, we got this radio show that is being listened to by someone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a big break. We you can know? get a, nine people to come out. Yeah, so, yeah. And eventually McCullough said, all right, but it's just temporary. Yeah. Because <laughs> he was so like- fucking stupid. <laughs> they wanted the audience. Uh, that what they wanted to keep the that audience, name, which is really a shitty name. That was really <laughs> awful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the you know, but yeah, Bruce hated the the name, the audience. I think, or the kids in the hall. You mean. I mean, the name, the yeah. kids in the hall. Yeah, and I think he's only maybe just in the last few years come to terms with it. <laughs> Finally, good for yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so now in Canada, it's different. It seems like that when there is state-run television that you know people who have talent or that is undeniable will eventually be on television uh nothing could be further from the truth oh, okay. uh <laughs> is that it's, that's not true oh no it's uh well first off there was no very little um uh comedy done in canada on television like any of any kind of quality it was all really shitty like mainstream cheap kind of america ripoffs of america oh, okay shows all right at the time and um until uh till SCTV came along. Right. Uh and that was like a like a revolution in Canada. It like, was pretty great. Yeah. And when they started like they started doing the show at a global TV in Toronto for like they were making shows for like five thousand dollars an episode or something. Did you know those guys? Did you go watch the shows or did you uh well I just watched them on TV. at that point I was TV. living in a really small town in called Cremor, about a thousand people, about two hours out of Toronto. Uh-huh. And I used to spend like an hour every n- like I forget when they were on, like Tuesday nights. Every yeah. night, every night that they were on, and it was a half hour show. I would, yeah. I would have to go up into the attic, uh, like an hour before the show, and start trying to adjust the antenna. Was that where your family lived? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I'd be up there, like, like moving the antenna a quarter inch, yeah. shouting out the window. Is that better? Yeah. You know, because we didn't have a rotor, and the antenna was just lying on the floor in the attic. And your dad's, uh, you know, saying, "I don't know, I can't." can't. Yeah. <laughs> what difference does it make? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah. So I'd be shouting, and you know, to take, so after about an hour, I'd yeah. get it tuned in enough that you could make out an image. Yeah, and then we'd go down, and we'd all watch SCTV. It was really great, wasn't it? Yeah, and that was the first time it had occurred to anyone. I mean, in Canada, the only other comedy that had been done in Canada was a show called Wayne and Schuster, mm-hmm. uh, which real comedy students will know. I have no idea what that is. Yeah, they were they were a comedy team uh, that started out in like the four, and during the Second World War on radio. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And they then in the fifties they were like the they had they were like the most repeated guests on the uh, Ed Sullivan show. No kidding. 
He, they were Ed loved them. He would give them like 20 minutes of the show. Right. They would do these sprawling 20-minute sketches with huge sets and costumes. Uh-huh. They did like a, a sketch called, a, called uh, a Caesar sketch. They, it was like 20 minutes long, and it was about a private detective investigating the murder of Caesar. Yeah, yeah. And I remember my dad. My dad was a big comedy nerd, uh-huh. too, I should say that. he. Uh, but he would... Uh, the joke he used to always quote from that sketch, you know, say, you know, Johnny Wayne walks into a bar, goes up to the bartender, says, bartender, I'd like a Martinez. And the bartender says, uh, you mean a martini? And Johnny Wayne says, if I'd wanted to, I would have ordered two. <laughs> no. Yeah. And your dad loved that he one. He loved that joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, the, so as the TV came along, suddenly we thought, oh, you can actually make something of quality and that's that's kind of hip and and it had know. its own thing i mean yeah. it really it, like the the sort of umbrella of the network yeah uh, kind of built this this arena for sketches just to and impressions and everything to take place yeah yeah and, also, and actually have backstory yes and then, right. that's how they started yeah they started developing all that that you know that yeah almost sitcom reality right. you know um and it was yeah and it's just they were such amazing performers and writers that it was like just this you know it, you just hadn't seen anything. It was like suddenly, suddenly it was no longer square to be Canadian. So that did that influence you guys almost immediately? I oh, mean, definitely. Again, we were kids when this started. I was like twelve when that show went on the air. But it's interesting Canada. because, like you know, you the kids in the hall became sort of a template for for sketch uh, sketch groups. You know, you know, coming out of the eighties and even up through now, and and a lot of sketch people sort of source. Monty Python as an influence, but I have not talked to anybody that really, because you're Canadian and because that was what you saw and it was like indigenous and mm -hmm. it was it, that, you know, that is, that's the template. That was the thing that blew your mind. Yeah. Well, for us, it was just the fact that you could, the, the realization that you could do it. You mm -hmm. could make a show in Canada and it didn't have to be, you know, you know, just lame. It didn't or, have to be lame. Right. You know, which we all thought Canadian TV just is just by nature lame. Right. Um, and so we realized you couldn't, but but out of our love for SCTV, we very very carefully didn't do anything they did. Right. Like we did no parody. We really veered away from parody. We didn't do celebrity impersonations, like so we just thought they were so much better at it than we would ever be. So when you guys laid out this agenda, I mean, how old were you when you finally you know you know pulled together the the cast that became the kids in the hall? We were like nineteen was, or twenty. Uh, I was. Uh, when we when it became the five of us, I was I just turned twenty. Um, and it was like, well, I guess when it really gelled was probably 84. Uh, but what was the, the mode of operation? I mean, what, what were your rules? I mean, were you just you, in, in the sense where you would all write together or you said that you didn't want to do parody, you yeah. didn't want to do, uh, impressions? Yeah. So we wouldn't do anything. Yeah. We wouldn't do anything that was like a TV format. Right. Like we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't do game and shows. And you guys agreed or, on this. Yeah. It was just, we just all agreed that stuff was off limits to Because us. of SCTV. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't want to be hung with the ripoff. Yeah, we wanted to figure something, a new way of doing something. You know, so it was all sort of you know, uh, you, you know. Push... And we had rules about Python. Also, because of Python, we love Python. We said, all right, all of our sketches have to have beginning, middle, and end. You know, we weren't going to do any sketches that didn't end because that was Python. So. Yeah, yeah. So you had to avoid. You know, well, that's respectable because sometimes I don't understand sketches because they don't have a beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I'm one of these people, like you know, people who love sketch, and sometimes I watch sketches and I'm like, why? Well, I don't understand the point of any of that. Yeah, what, what yeah. just happened? <laughs> yeah. So how did it become decided? Like for instance, was there there points where you you decided you know who made a better woman? Uh, who yeah. would you know who did what type of characters? Because it seems that with the kids in the hall, and this is something that that it's hard to come by. Uh, you all sort of had very defined stage personalities. Yeah, and 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 I don't know if that it evolved outside of the group or what, but it, it was a very unique thing because yeah. many people flounder for stage personalities. But as yourselves, you all seem to know your wheelhouse in terms yeah. of what you. Can well, we do. had very little in common with each other as people. Is that <laughs> That's true? Part of it, yeah. You know, we we uh, other than the fact that we could all that that we can make each other laugh. Uh huh. You know, we were very very different. Well, how would you characterize kind of, that? Bruce is different. How? Uh, Bruce is like a a, a, a little tiny bully. Uh -huh. uh, you know, he was like <laughs> always a little tiny bully. He was like he did wrestling in high school. Oh, okay, you know that kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, uh, and was uh, really you know sort of loved creating his own sort of punk mythology about himself. And oh, okay, but we're all you know, and I was the I was I guess the prissy intellectual in the group. Uh -huh. you know? And Kevin, Kevin was the the clown. Uh -huh. You know, and Mark. 
Mark uh, the Cypher <laughs> and Scott the Fag. Okay. Uh, okay. So it all worked out. Yeah. But it was like, no, but I mean, we were very, like, different people. We still are very different people. But we get, you know, but we love being in this group together. Um, and as I said, it was like we didn't really have a manifesto. It was just we kind of instinctively knew the stuff that we weren't going to do. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, uh, and, like, when we first started, when we were doing the club shows, we used to play women without any makeup or wardrobe or even wigs. We used uh-huh. to just, it was all just done with body posture and, uh-huh. and, and, and voice. Because, you know, we, we really wanted to avoid getting laughs off being men playing women. Yeah. And we were only playing women because we couldn't get any women to stay in the group. So Right. Oh, um, really? What happened? They Who would get tried? hired. Okay. They would get hired by somebody. Oh, really? Yeah. They were time, taken away? Anytime. Yeah, every, Second City would hire anybody that we uh, that we had. So so you guys had to do what you had to do. Yeah. So <laughs> Be women. Yeah. And then when it came to TV, we realized we'd actually have to start dressing up as women. Oh, yeah. You know. And uh, did anyone have a problem with that? No, yeah. no, no, we just, but again, we came into it, we had very clear instructions to all of our, like, we kept saying makeup and wardrobe, but don't make the, that funny, we'll be, we'll do the funny part. You like just, what? Like, don't, you don't have to over Yeah, we didn't want to be, yeah, we didn't want it to be Mock drag, women. no drag queen stuff, right. you right. know, no Milton Berle, it right. was, we want people to forget that we're men. And what's the consensus on uh, who played the best woman? Well, me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we all play good women. Yeah. But if 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 the if it called for the woman to be attractive, yeah, then it was me. Okay. <laughs> you know, most well, of the time. That's a nice thing to know about yourself. Yeah, I was the sexy one. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good. And now, that's... when did the heat start to build? I mean, when did you know that you know a phenomenon was starting to occur? Was it before the well, TV show? Oh yeah, it was about a year or two. Well, actually, a few years before the TV show. It was like eighty four. We suddenly started going from playing to like five people. It seemed like overnight. Suddenly, we were playing to a packed room and there were like lineups were starting in the afternoon going around the block of this like we were playing in this like 200 seat bar now could you can you attach that to anything that was going on with you other than just the thing started just I gelling know, I, I think just word of mouth started to spread about you know what was going what we were doing there you know because we were on queen street in toronto which used to be uh you know that was like the hipster district and you know and what bits were you doing there at the beginning Anything uh, that made the show? Stuff that made the show. Some of it, I think, uh, made the show. Um, what were I the mean, biggest bits in your mind You know that you did? In those days? Well, I mean, just in general. Like, what do people remember you for? Um, like, or the group for? Well, the, the Head Crusher thing. Oh, yeah. Huge. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, Scott's Buddy Cole character. Uh-huh. Um, Kevin and I, it's uh, Simon and Hecubus. Right. And the chicken, wasn't the, the chicken, chicken lady? Yeah, yeah, yeah. chicken lady. Um and things, some things like we did a thing called Doctor Seuss Bible uh-huh. that I, we only did it. It was only one sketch, but I hear we hear about that a lot. Oh, really? Because it was you know um, at the time shocking because uh, we crucified Christ in it uh, <laughs> in the Doctor Seuss way. In the Doctor Se- to Doctor Seuss first, <laughs> and with all Doctor Seuss colors and <laughs> backgrounds. That was controversial, but we actually showed like nails going through. <laughs> See that the Lenny Bruce research paid off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now was the writing process all of you guys, or did some of you come to the table with stuff? And how did that? It work? would be everyone would everyone would uh, like even like before the TV show. We used to you know we all had day jobs, so we'd meet Friday, um, and. The five of us, everyone would throw up, throw out ideas they had for sketches. Yeah, and you'd see if anybody clicked with any of it, and then you'd sort of, uh, we'd talk it through, and then you'd you'd go off with uh, whoever had the best take on the sketch, and you'd write it as a like two or three guys, and uh, then by you know Sunday we'd all come back together and start rehearsing everything, and Monday we'd put the show up. So we'd we'd because we advertise we do an hour of new material every week. So every Monday we had to come up with an hour of material, and you did that, yeah, for about four years before you got the show. Yeah, that's unbelievable. Yeah, so you had this fucking work ethic as a group that, like, when the TV people finally got, they were like, "This is this is great." They're, oh yeah, we they're self contained. We yeah, we were we generated material really fast, and we were, and we had all, and we had developed our style, I guess, for what whatever that is for over four years working together yeah. every yeah. Monday. Yeah, doing like you know forty plus shows a year. Yeah. And, wow! Um, yeah, That's and serious dudes as a group. Yes, yeah, so we do an hour of written material, and then we do an hour to an hour and a half of improv after that, uh, which was you know, which sometimes would get interesting because by the last part of the improv set, we'd all be pretty drunk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is any know. of that stuff on tape? Uh, yeah, some of it, and some of it's actually on some of the DVDs as, as bonus features because our friend Paul Bellini, who also became a writer on the show, uh, he uh, he got it. He used to videotape with an you know an eight millimeter video camera. Uh huh. 
Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Not even soup. Not even high eight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it's, it's on there. Oh, that's great. Grainy, but yeah. So when the TV break came, you guys were like ready to go. Yeah, we felt you know. In, well, in '85, we got we got scouted by Saturday Night Live, and then uh, uh, Mark and Bruce got hired as apprentice writers. Right. Uh, which meant they didn't have an office. Right. They got uh, sucked into the machine to yeah. teach them a lesson about show business. Yes. Yeah, so they right. were down there for the 85 season, mm -hmm. uh, which you'll remember as the Randy Quaid, uh, Robert Downey Jr., Anthony yeah. Michael Hall year. Yeah. I believe it's... I, I don't think there's any debate that it's the worst year was ever. Was that one of the Lorne Free years? It was the Lorne, Lorne's first year back. Oh, it was. So he was After trying to make a splash with celebrity power. Yeah. yeah. So, and arguably, I think the worst year of Saturday Night Live ever I have had. no recollection of it. No one, no one does. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, except for someone who's not, now like Renfield in an insane asylum. Right, yeah, <laughs> he's yeah, the yeah, only yeah. person who remembers that year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just eating bugs and going, ah, oh, Terry Sweeney. <laughs> yeah, oh uh, yeah, that's right. So they they were down there and were uh, they cast members too, or that they, came later? No, they, they didn't. Mark was a cast member, wasn't he? Years later, some, after oh, we after we shut our show down, he, right. he went to Saturday Night Live. Right. Um, he, uh, but they were writing there. And and we all thought, oh well, that's it. That's the end of the troop. And you know, these guys are going to go off to New York. And uh, was there? That must have been more than that. Wasn't there fights? And like, you know, what the fuck are you doing? You know, no. It was like we were just. It was actually we did a big show. We did a final show before they left town. Wow. And it was huge. It was like, you know, it was like this. You know, I said the room's supposed to hold two hundred people maximum. Yeah. And I think we had like six hundred people in there. Uh huh. Some nights. I'm glad you Canadians, man. You, know? you weren't. There was no sort of like fuck you guys. No, we were uh, we you know there was a lot of crying at oh, the wow. end of that show, a lot of hugging and crying. Wow, that's fucking uh, touching. Know, yeah. A lot of you know wishing you know wishing wow. wishing them the best. And, yeah, you know we didn't know if it you know what was going to happen. Yeah, but then uh, what happened is they went down and did Saturday Night Live, and you know we'd all heard about the workload there, yeah. and then we found out that's all bullshit. They don't work that hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that hard a gig. Yeah, they get like they get like. Every three weeks, they get a week off. Yeah, yeah. And then they get like two weeks off at Thanksgiving and two weeks off at Christmas, and then they're off for seven months. And then we were going, what the fuck? You got and so they they started. So we just immediately said, all right, well, on your weeks off, come up, we'll write new shows and do new shows. <laughs> and they did. Yeah. So every time they had a week off, which was constantly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just that was the biggest surprise of all the bullshit. Saturday Live is not that hard. So you guys could keep working. Yes, yeah, so they kept coming up, and we'd write shows and do new material every week, or like we'd we'd you know we'd do a show every month. We used yeah. to do a show every week, so we started doing a show every month. Right. And. Um, and then eventually uh, the, their season was done, and Lauren kept hearing about the rest of the group. He, sure. I mean, because he had heard, like, people like all the people from SCTV used to come see our shows. At, oh, at really? Street. Yeah. You got to know them? Yeah, they had all started, like, I think Catherine O'Hara and her sister Mary were the first to come down. She's and, fucking and great. And Robin Duke. Yeah. And then, you know, Marty Short and Dave. Well, Dave Thomas just came down pretty early uh -huh. to the shows. Um, were they nostalgic uh, or were they, you know, just sort of like into watching the, the young generation? Or they just heard that there was something good going on. Oh, and they dug <laughs> and it, And they huh? wanted to see what, what it was. Did you ever invite them on stage for improvs and stuff? Uh, Catherine, I think Catherine and Robin came up uh, and did some improv with us. And also the, like, the main stage cast of Second City in Toronto used to come down. Uh, it was like, you know, guys like so you guys were the shit. Yeah, we were like the yeah we were the talk of the town. Yeah, you know, at that point. And then Lauren said, "I need to own them." Well, Lauren came up and he, he was gonna to see if he wanted to bring any of us down as performers. Yeah, you know. And I think at one point, uh, and at this point, we were working pretty closely with uh, our friend Pam Thomas and Dave Thomas's then wife, and yeah. our friend Diane Pauly, who was Sarah Pauly's mom, who was right. passed away. But uh, they were sort of managing us, and. Um, so Lauren, uh, so all you know, Lauren came up to see our show, and at one point I think there was some talk that I was going to go down as a feature player, uh -huh. and Mark and Bruce going to make us write it. But then Lauren decided uh, that he was going to that he didn't want to break the troop up, that he wanted to keep the troop together and and develop a show for us, which was nice of him because we put him through the worst <laughs> audition show you could ever. We did about an hour and a half of new material. Yeah. Uh, like really, like stuff we had never done before. Uh huh. Um, and and then and then at the break we went over and we basically guilted Lorne into staying for the improv set. 
<laughs> How'd it go? <laughs> it was well. We did like and then we did like an hour and a half of improv. <laughs> you really wanted we it. We were just it's like the a- biggest asshole move on earth. Yeah, it wasn't even like like that's the worst thing to do if you want to get hired. <laughs> <laughs> annoy the guy. <laughs> annoy Hold him hostage. Yeah, yeah and yeah. make him feel like shit if he yeah. tries to leave. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And it was like weird. We had because other sketch groups tried to crash our show. Because uh, they heard Lauren was there. What do you mean? They started doing sketch in the audience? Yeah, there was like there was a show going across the street, and they were trying to get Lauren to come over. And then somebody came in and like stormed up on our stage, and started started reciting a poem. Get the uh, fuck out of here! Trying to get Lauren over. Did you to know the other these stage. people? No, no. And I think Scott Thompson. It was a girl. <laughs> it was like this girl's reciting a poem, trying to get Lauren to come over to their show across the street. That's unbelievable. And uh, Scott uh, wittily ad libbed, "Get the fuck off our stage." <laughs> And just shoved her off the stage. <laughs> Good for him. Yeah. You know, we had a punk rock kind yeah, of mentality I'll say. in those days. Yeah. So he sees it and he decides to do it. Yeah. On and Canadian his, television. Yeah. Well, actually, we were on. We were signed to HBO first. Uh huh. So he he had a, he sold us to HBO, um, and then CBC came in in Canada after that. Okay. Um, so it was a joint production. Yeah. And you were on HBO. We were on HBO for two years. Two years. Two or three. Because, I mean, by the Three time... Years, yeah, yeah, I mean, when you, I know you're on Comedy Central, like, yeah. forever. Yeah, from and, the you, beginning, yeah. And uh, and that's where you sort of you know built this army of 8- uh, yeah, to 12-year-old girls. Creepy. Yeah, we were on... Well, I think we were the only thing on Comedy Central for, for a, a while. Time. You know, we were on, like, we were on like like five times a day for about five years. And I people's... Uh, and, and your fans, like, are loyal. Yeah. I mean, yes. they're still around, I'd imagine. Yeah, yes, they are, which is great. You and know? Uh, when you tour now, do they, they must be thrilled to see these, these girls that were girls and now they're women. Yep. Oh, versus... yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yes. there was a lot of women. Am I wrong? A I lot mean... of female characters, yeah. And, but a lot of uh, female fans. Oh, the fans. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of, a lot of, uh, yes. A lot of young, a lot of young women who have trouble looking up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think those are our fan base. You know, you know. <laughs> Hey, hey, how you doing? Yeah. That, but they're still with you. I mean, when you tour, like the last, when did you go out last? A year uh, ago? 2008 was the last right. tour we did. And you sold out, right? Uh, yeah, we still managed to sell it. And it's, and it's weird. It's because we still have like uh, kids like high school and college age. And then, you know, then people all the way up to our age, you know, people into their well, 50s. I, like I said, I think you're an institution and a an inspiration to people. And, and sketch is like the biggest thing around now. It is yeah. the it is the template for a comedy career, and you know certainly yeah. you get credit for being you know one of the best sketch operations ever. Yeah, which is fantastic. It really is a nice feeling. I mean, like I actually listened to your Cordry interview and hear, just hearing Rob, who I know, yeah, just hearing him mention Kids in the Hall sure. as one of his you know influences. Yeah, you know, yeah. Oh, that's that's which, something which makes you feel really nice. Of yeah. course, it's, yeah. uh, you, you've you've done a great thing, and it's documented, and it will be there forever, long after you sadden of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the the news radio thing now that I mean that was huge too, right? Uh, yeah. And that yeah. was a very set character, and you were very you, and and yeah. uh, a great ensemble cast. Yeah. And that yeah. went on for how long? Five years. That's a good run. It went into syndication. Yeah. And yeah. then uh, and then you had to marry the wrong people. So you, uh, well, I married the wrong people early in the kids in the hall years. Now let me ask you something. If we're gonna if switch gears now, yeah. because I've been married twice myself. Now, mm-hmm. when you married your first wife. I mean, you guys loved each other, didn't you? No. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> I loved her when we first started uh, dating. Well, here's the word. The thing, she, it's, it's uh, tortured beginnings because she was actually a girl I, was, I wanted to ask out, and then I lost my job, and I couldn't take her out. Yeah. So I didn't ask her out. And, and in the meantime, my best friend started dating her. Oh, God. Uh, and they started living together. Oh. But while they were living together, you know, she and I were getting closer and closer. As pals? As pals. Sure. You know, but then I started, like, you know, yeah. feeling like I was falling for her. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the, and this, of course, one of those nights where I said, you know what? We got to maybe stop hanging out so much because I'm starting to have these feelings and yeah. you're my best friend's girlfriend. Yeah. And so she showed me her tits. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you realize maybe uh, he's not oh, my best well, friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, really? Well, okay. she, you know, and, um, well, that's and romantic. So then, yeah. And yeah. so then so I wound up stealing my best friend's uh, girlfriend. How's that friendship holding up? Uh, not so. Uh, we, we tried for a while. Uh-huh. We did try for a while back in those days. But, you know, this is, again, I'm like, you know, this is like, uh, you know, 20 years old I'm right, 20 sure. years old yeah and uh, so but it added to that that once I got into this relationship with her and realized almost immediately 
oh my god, she's fucking crazy. Uh huh. Um, and almost this immediately is, you and this that. is horrible. Uh huh. But it was like, I, but it was, in my head, I went, I can't. Well, I can't just break up with her. I can't. I just ruined my. My friendship friendship yeah. yeah yeah this has to mean yeah. something i've got to hang in this has to mean something uh-huh. Uh-huh. you know that so i did you, this so you stayed in there i stayed in there and it was like through you know constant suicide threats and no oh, really that's and, really crazy good yeah, yeah. The, the immediate absence of sex uh-huh uh, oh really as, as we became a couple uh-huh except that, to have the kids that would guarantee yes. your income for the yes. rest of her life yes yes so that she lasted a- that lasted a slim 11 years wow of of celibacy isn't that interesting though because i'm the same way like but you knew she was crazy right away oh yeah and and from then on it was just me trying to find a way to get out of it in a in a decent way you know and again i'm 20 20 21 years old you you still you think you can help people at that age you know and i'm telling you dude that that does not go away it does for me (laughs) oh yeah yeah yeah, I, I it's still a lesson I have to learn. I was surprised that I had to learn it. Oh, I that know. I have that part of me. That's I see a- crazy eyes now, and I'm I'm out of it immediately. Really, I'm, good for you. you. Know, I can like I can I can see I can tell if someone's crazy at like two or three blocks away. Really? Yes. Just to eat, they have an aura. Yeah, well, they're... I grew up with. I think it was I grew up with a father who was borderline personality disorder. Was he really diagnosed? Yeah, diagnosed. Yeah. That was. I didn't find this out till when my my first wife and I split up. She was diagnosed as borderline personality disorder. See, I'm just dealing with somebody that has those characteristics. Well, I mean, it's over now, oh, but it's it's tricky stuff. Terrifying terrifying it's terrifying because you, you will never be able to give them what they want no and the more you try the more they hate you oh yeah. wow that is fucking beautiful yeah so yeah the more the more you say you know uh, do you you know do you love me if i do this and then yes i love you if you do that well what if i do this yeah <laughs> yes, I love you. All right, how about this? <laughs> that's right. You know? That's part of it. You know, and it's like, you don't love me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I proved it. Yeah, yeah. But they find people like uh, like that have the dynamic that will keep trying. Yes. And trying you, to make it better. Trying to make it better. And yeah. you have n- nothing else can happen, but you become depleted completely on a soul level. Yeah, and, and again, because again, because having grown up with that, my father. You're we're, wired we're, to fucking, you're wired to engage with it. Because my whole life was trying to right. get him to love me, you know, and trying to prove you know, and also, you know, that his love was always conditional. Right. You know, growing up. And that's not supposed to be a parental love, the conditional no. thing. And so for me, part of it was like, with, uh, as I learned in therapy, mm-hmm. um, was that for me, it was like trying to prove to myself that unconditional love was possible. Right. And by, by giving it to someone else. Who, who will never be able to. Who can never accept it. And we can't be unconditional anyways. No, but I was, that's why I, I thought I, I, no matter what she does, I'll just, I'll just keep loving her, keep loving her. And of course, eventually I became, you know, twisted and you know emotionally as well well that because like i just dealt with something like that and i and i thought that what i was doing being that i was married to somebody once before who wasn't like that and she had we had other issues but i thought well i'm going to do it right this time and just sort of make some compromises and yeah. accept the w- the way she wants to live her life as yeah. best i can yeah and then you realize like wait she's defying me to yeah. to yeah. like her here, <laughs> yeah, like that, like wait, that's pushing yeah. it. You're pushing it, but I'll try to deal with it. Wait, you're pushing harder. Yeah, and I'd grown up watching my dad treat my mom like shit. So Holy it's fuck! Of, you know, then being like a young man who considers himself a feminist, I thought I wanted to prove that men could be something different from what my father was. So it's all this dynamic feeding into me, just going, okay, all right, I can take it. Just one more day. Yeah. One more day. All right, if I just figure this out. <laughs> yeah, figure it out. If I just figure it out, then she'll be happy. <laughs> and she'll love me, and we'll both be happy. And that transitions to, okay, one more day, and if I can just, if I can figure this out, <laughs> I can leave and she won't kill herself. And I won't be responsible for her killing herself. And, and then it's just, you know, and then it gets sicker and sicker, <laughs> you know, until, you know, it, you know, and again, then finally it was like, uh, living in LA starting news radio. And I, for the first time in my life, I was down here for about, uh, six months on my own yeah. starting news radio. Yeah. Uh, cause, uh, cause she was back home, uh, pregnant with, uh, our second child. Mm-hmm. So she didn't want to come down to LA. Yeah. Uh, because it would destroy the fetus. Uh, <laughs> somehow um, yeah she might not have been wrong yeah but uh <laughs> so um so i was here for six months and it was like first time in you know 11 year uh, you know 11 years where i'm going where i i could i was some i was relaxed you could breathe yeah you know i suddenly i could relax and i could and i was going out and having fun with the cast yeah and, you know, and I was and I was falling in love with more tyranny. You know, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. she's so great. You know, if I was single, I could go out with someone like that. Yeah, and it was like one of those things. You know, I remember like uh, 
driving driving my car on the way to work one day, and it was actually it was it was a a, a bare naked lady song uh, came on my stereo. Yeah, uh, a Steve Page song called and uh, and uh, uh, was that I never meant to break your heart. It was the song. Yeah, and it was like, and the song comes on, and I suddenly just burst out in tears as I'm driving. <gasps> oh man! And like I have to pull off the road. Yeah, and just sit at the side of the road, just weeping, and I and that's why I go. Oh, okay, yes. this is a sign. I think <laughs> that I'm not happy. <laughs> <laughs> I think when I'm so unhappy, I can't drive safely. <laughs> that, the, the wrong song comes on. Yeah. So that I, like got us into therapy, and that eventually led to things starting to improve, which of course led to her taking off for the kids. Really? Yeah. Yeah. As soon as things actually started to get almost bearable for me to live this, you know, going oh. And well. she got better too. No, no, no. It, oh, just, oh. it just seemed like she was getting better because cause I was doing things. I went, like I used to be like in our marriage, it would be like I would finish work and I had better be home within the amount of time it takes to drive from the studio to the to the driveway. Right. And any time that, and that unaccounted for there would be the cause of a fight. Right. Like if I stopped off, like Steve Fruit and I, if we stopped off at a CD store to buy right. CDs, right. which we love to do. Yeah. Uh, that would be a huge fight that would that would last for months. Right, but you when know? you fought, like, was there yelling and screaming and? Oh, yelling, screaming! She would tear my clothes, throw stuff at me. Oh like, my physic, god! Physic, physically violent. I would have to restrain her. Really? Yeah, it become really physically violent. That's that borderline fun. It's called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, but isn't it interesting though because you're wired for it and I'm, I seem to be wired for it too. That when you when you're engaged in that fighting thing, yeah. that there. There, it's it's horrible, but it's compelling. And usually, after those fights, there's that weird reprieve uh, where where you you're both exhausted from it, and it's really the only time where you you're actually like, no, I, I didn't have that. No, I didn't have that. Oh. That sounds nice. Oh, that sounds sorry. like that would have been sorry. a nice. I, maybe if I just waited longer, I could no. have had what you had. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, we would have. There'd be this horrible, horrible fight. Yeah. And then for her, it would be over, which usually meant I had apologized and it was yeah. all my fault. Yeah. And, uh, and suddenly she's fine. Yeah. Like going, mm, yeah, yeah. everything's good. And, you know, but I'm still like, you have, you're shaking. getting cancer. Yeah. I'm shaking and I'm, I, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm feeling this, you know, rage and self loathing. Oh and, my God. And, and, and in her head, it's going, what the fuck's your problem? Oh God. God, get over it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And you're doing talk radio on, on, on news radio on top of all this. Yeah. I'm doing news radio and, and you're, uh, you're, 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 I guess that's interesting because have you ever thought about how much of your comedic character comes from this ability to repress emotion? Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Like, because I just really realized there, there's something about your the comedic persona that you sort of manage, even yeah. the most horrendous of things. Like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's because the only the my, cause, uh, the thing I learned from my mother, which was basically the uh, her cre her her motto for everything in life was don't fuss. Okay, and I said, no, oh, don't fuss. <laughs> But there's it's yeah. yes, it, but there's it's things just, horrible things are happening. <laughs> oh, don't fuss! <laughs> oh, it's yeah. so beautifully painful. Yeah. So, uh, so you, you know, get a so divorce from this one finally. We finally, well, we finally split up, and um, and because she leaves me. Yeah. Oh, they, yeah. yeah. Because we're in therapy, and I, I insisted on getting us into therapy, yeah. and so we're in therapy for about you know six months. Yeah. And and again, I'm saying, oh well, you know, I feel free to go out and buy a pair of socks, yeah. <laughs> and not have to get home and go. How could you buy those socks? Yeah, right. Those you, socks are ugly. You could be proud of your socks. You are an ugly person <laughs> for choosing ugly socks. Oh god. You know, that's the kind of yeah. you know. That's... So I, I had not made a decision about anything in yeah. eleven years. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Except in my work. In my work, I make decisions all day long. Huge right. decisions. Right. You know, I'm helping. And you're a, functioning. I help run a show. Yeah. You know, I run the kids in the hall with yeah. you know the other four guys you know and yeah making decisions without any problem but at home it's like nothing I but, can't but were it. the guys sort of like dude you gotta no we're... one does that no they Not... just quietly hated her yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's the Canadian way. Yeah, they just quietly hated her, and like yeah, really, no same thing. My whole family just really? quietly hated her, and, you know. And you were just taking the hit, no support, no yeah. sort of lifelines, just sort of like no, and, like the, and none of them were allowed in my house you know, because you know, of like, her. Yeah, yeah, Ugh. she wouldn't let anyone come over. And, uh, uh, but so, and then you know, same thing when we get down to L.A. But uh, yeah, so then finally, that's uh, over. So eleven, eleven years, uh, really eleven years of celibacy. Yeah. Um, 
Aggravated celibacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah which is not no. sustainable. No. Because um, I do like sex. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I, well, at that point, I remembered liking sex. Yeah, yeah. You had a, an you idea know. of what it used to be. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, so suddenly I'm, I'm single, living in L.A., yeah. and starring in a network sitcom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. All right. You're an item. You're uh, hot. Yeah. yeah. Although then I, found, catch. then I found out early on, I found out that I had, for, I had, for, I had forgotten how to come. That oh, was a problem. Really? You ever had that? <laughs> yeah, where it's like, I know something's supposed to happen at the end <laughs> yeah, of this. Yeah, I've literally forgotten how to come. <laughs> oh, so I, mean, I, was with a, I was with a woman who was an amazing woman early yeah. after my, our split up. Uh, and we were having sort of a relationship. Yeah. And she's trying really hard. Wow. You know, and I, yeah. was, I was thinking, come on, it's been 11 years. Yeah. I'm going to I'm yeah. gonna shoot her across the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, she's going to go, sure. go like a bottle rocket. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but then I just, I can't. Come. It took wow. me like about six months, and women, but they must have been fairly impressed with your your stamina. It was it was fun up to a point up right. to the, up to the point of chafing. I right, think. and then it's like, and then they're like, they think they that's they, they, me. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. No, no, you know. <laughs> but you figured it out. But that must have been because you were so emotionally fucking numb. Yes, yeah. on all levels. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And I uh, just was not connected to my body at all. Anymore. So tell me the one that you figured out how to come with is the one you ended up marrying. <laughs> No, no. Okay. No, no. I I figured out how to come, and then I then I figured out how to come with just about every woman living in Los Angeles <laughs> for about a five year period. Good for you. I, uh, yeah. Was just I was just oh. You're like a kid in a candy store. Just oh, it's like I have I've got money in my pocket. <laughs> and I can I, come. Uh, oh, Who wants some of this? I have a house with a pool. Oh, great. <laughs> and my place, my house was always full of. My literally, I had a. I don't. Did you ever come up to a party at my place in the Hollywood Hills uh-uh. back in the nineties? No. Um, it was great. Yeah, they were, they were okay. legendary parties. Yeah, up I bet. There. Yeah, and the pool was always full of naked people. Yeah. Um. Oh, look at you. Looking. I know. It was. I really. It was way more fun to go to my place than the Playboy Mansion. Yeah. I found out one of the things I learned is that if you have a pool and you keep it heated all through the winter to ninety-five degrees. Yeah. Almost any woman that comes up there will take all of her clothes off. <laughs> Let me women, write that down for maybe yeah, that. Maybe I'm, that might still happen to me. Yes. Women yeah. get straight from the convent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go, ah, off with the habit. Yes. Yeah. I oh, need nice. to swim naked in yeah. this pool. Oh, good for you. So you were uh, doing the uh, the happy Satan thing. It was really fun. Yeah, yeah. I bet. Uh, for Yeah. So that was about, yeah, about five years mm-hmm. of that. Mm-hmm. And then I met my, my second wife, who was... Who was uh, doing a show called White Trash Wins Lotto. Wait a minute. Remember that show? Sure. It was, uh, yeah, it was, um, Andy Preboy wrote it, and it was Paul His Tom. wife, Rita, right? Rita, yeah, Rita Delbert was in it. Right. Uh, who now does Lucha Vavoon. Uh huh. Yeah, no, I know, I know Rita. I haven't yeah. seen Andy in a long time. No, Paul. Yeah. And Paul F. Tompkins sure. was in it, Blaine Capatch. Yeah. yeah. Um, was, I remember that era. Those Pat, were the, that was the Largo Pat era. Warm up for yeah, it. the yeah. first Largo era. Yeah. And so, your, uh, who was your wife? Uh, Chrissy Guerrero. Uh huh. And so she was up, she was in the show as one of the singers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I met her and I was, you know, it was actually, well, I was actually in the audience with a friend of mine watching the show and my friend Craig Northy, who's in a Canadian band, The Odds. Yeah. And, uh, and actually in the show said, ah, oh, I, why don't, I should have a girl like that. Yeah. About, and, uh. This is after your five year run. Of, yeah. Yeah. You, you're ready to settle down again. Pretty. She smiles a lot. Yeah. She's, uh. Sings. She sings beautifully. Mm. And uh, everyone seems to like her. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll have one of those. Yeah, I'll, and 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 kind of just like hit on her for about a year. You did? Yeah. Uh huh. Because I met her that night, and but she had a boyfriend. And I remember you those days. That was the Argo time, and uh, Amy Mann was around, and you know, there was mm-hmm. a lot. Of, it was like a real thing. Yeah, Zach. yeah. It was. I first went there with Amy and to yeah. see Paul uh, John Bryan show. Right, yeah. right. It was like a, that first that original Argo was quite the scene. It was great. Yeah, yeah. and then they had, yeah the Monday night comedy shows were great. And yep. Then eventually Paul started doing his shows there. Yep. You know, yeah, it was a really amazing scene, musically and comedically. Yeah, it was. It would change the game. Yeah, that was like even because that's back before even like before, when Bob and David didn't have their show yet. No, they yep. were, they were doing bits. I remember day. I would come out and go there, and it was like definitely a happening thing. Yeah, it was amazing. I remember because I would go call, tell the guys back in Toronto, I'd say, you know, there's a lot of comedy here that I think might be better than us. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And they go, no, <laughs> can't <laughs> so, yeah, be. Yeah. I'd, yeah. You know, I'd be telling them about you know some of the stuff I was seeing. And yeah, going, you guys should come down here. Yeah, and they you did. Uh, some of them did. Yeah. You know. I now so you married her. How long did that last? 
Uh, I don't want to poke years. at it too much. Eight All right. Years. And did, did was it different than the other one? Just for my own information, in terms of hope in the future, did you did you end up with somebody who revealed themselves as crazy again? No, she's not crazy. Uh, but she eventually got worn down by having to deal with my first crazy wife. You know, and oh. having to deal with you know me. Oh. You know, I'm you know right. Uh, really, well. you got some baggage or. I, you know, I'm not, you know, I have, you know, yeah, I guess I'm, you know, uh -huh. what am I? I'm, I'm dyslexic. I have, you know, ADD, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. uh, a crazy ex-wife. Crazy ex-wife. You like to have a few cocktails. I drink too much, mm -hmm. yeah, yes. I'll go on a, I'll go on a bender uh -huh. occasionally. Occasionally, yeah. You know, um, but, uh, so I, you know, I have my emotional problems, uh, but I think a lot of, a lot of it was just that all of our money was going to this crazy first wife and they were living like, millionaires and we were you know struggling to get by right you know uh you know you know it's like you know you know kids out there going to the most expensive schools in the country going to like camp every summer that cost me is 50, she remarried 50 grand oh good god no she can't right because no. then you're off the hook yeah well no she, she would still get all the child support regardless but, right but uh and you had a kid with the second wife too yeah then we had we have a daughter named alina and you like her my daughter, yeah, she's fantastic. Now, do you get along with the second wife? Yeah, we're getting along great, actually. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, we've gone through some rough periods, but we get along great. We and do. she's reasonable? She is. She's fantastic, and she understands when, you know, that. like right now, it's a real problem. I mean, I just went through a court uh, proceeding in Canada where the judge ruled I have to pay about three or four times my average monthly income every month to my first wife. Oh God, I'm so sorry, man. So that's that's part of why I'm doing stand up. I'm so sorry that yeah. like it's just like it's never, it's never goes away, and and it's yeah. like it's hard to get any relief from. Like yeah. I had a, I don't have kids, and I had to deal with it to to a certain degree. But just the the fact that there's no end in sight, and, and no, that you have and no, no control, no rationalism to the pros to the laws. Right. Yeah, and there's no way to get around it because yeah. the woman with the children will will win out yeah. generally. Yeah, and it's just. You know, because I'm happy to give away half of my money. That yeah. would be great. I would love to be giving away half of my income. Yeah. But I'm literally obligated to give away, you know, more than 400% of my income. Right. Um, and and if not, go to jail is basically the situation I'm in. Fuck. You know, so, you know. So right now, I think I can't go to Canada right now or I'll be arrested at the border. And there's, really? Oh, yeah. And there's no way, then, then she's not open. There was no way, see, like, there's no way to go, like, here's the money. Go away. No, because I don't have enough money to make her do that. Yeah. I'd have to come up with a million dollars, I think. All right, so let's get a plan in place to get you the money you need, and then we'll okay. uh, have some coffee. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do the stand-up tour. Yeah. So that yeah. stand-up trying to, you know. Sure, and you're available for, for film and television. Film and television always. work, yeah. Okay. Uh, the yeah. kids in the hall, we're putting that together again, do another we keep, tour. We're going to try and do another tour. All right, that's do good. TV that's projects. good. All right, so that should get you about uh, even. <laughs> that'll uh, that'll get me to that'll probably be enough to get me down to zero dollars to live on every month. Uh -huh. All if I do all of that. Now, are you able to extrapolate extract any joy out of life right now, Dave? Because I, yeah. I need to know that when you leave yes. here that you. Yeah. I do. I do. I actually. That's the uh, thing that surprises me. I still have fun. You know. Yeah. I have fun uh, hanging out with my friends that are you know, mostly comedians and musicians. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Um, I have f f tremendous fun hanging out with my daughter. Uh, -huh. uh, I have fun with my, my second wife. You know, we can have a great time together. I had a great time on the holidays with her and her family. Oh, that's great. You know, I'm still very close to her family. So this, I still, you know, especially now that while well, I'm here and at least for the time being, they can't arrest me here. Uh -huh. So that's a, a little bit of a weight off my shoulders. Right. Cause uh, I don't think I would take to jail well. No. I don't think it's a say. I don't know what Canadian jails like, but uh... a lot like here. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, that that there is a consistency there. Yeah, jails yeah. just as bad in both yeah. places. Yeah, okay. It's still a, they're both punitive institutions yes. <laughs> where you can't leave. Yeah, and you're sort of at the whims of the warden and the other prisoners. Yeah, yeah. And I'm a person who's never yeah. been comfortable with that sort of thing. Sure, sure. You know? But um, no, but it's, I still can find pleasure, and I still like I still like I can still find the humor in the horrible situation. I'm in. Well, I, I hope that uh, you know. on some level that it'd be interesting for me to see, and it's not any sort of challenge, but you know, I find a great deal of relief in doing stand up. Uh, yeah. You know, despite that there's a necessity here for you to, mm -hmm. to do it, you know, financially, and you see it as a way to, to make some money, that if you really, 
you know, took some risks up there and explored this shit and dealt yeah. with some of your anger, I, I think you could do something pretty fucking exciting. Well, I think, well, creatively, it's already starting to go that road. Oh, good. I mean, it's a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about. I mean, it's hard not to deal with it when... It's all you I mean, think li- about. Literally, I have a judge, a judge, this is the, the judge ruled a few years ago, and this is the one that was just enforced, uh, that uh, my ability to pay is not relevant to my obligation. Right. That's one of the rulings, which is just insane in its outset. But then she also ruled that my death would not be considered a material change to my circumstances. Which means who would... So like, like, I'm saying, like, if I... Like I said, I called Kevin. I was like, if I die, you understand, you have to take my corpse out on the road. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to be out there doing another restaging of The Odd Couple. But, but this yeah. time, this time, Oscar's dead. <laughs> yeah, but, the but, Broadway musical version of Weekend at Bernie's. Yeah, with you really dead. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but or, what does that even mean, that your estate will have to continue paying? Or that, I mean, who else... Yeah, would, and there is no estate. Right. You know, like, basically, she'd be going after my daughter for money. And, and there's... You know... That's fucking horrendous, and you can't get any fucking justice out of this thing? No, because this is the family law in, in Ontario, where I'm from, uh, just says that the children's, the ch- after the, at, when the marriage dissolves, the children's life should be locked in amber, and it should just stay at that level no matter what. So, like, you know, the judge even said, like, if I was paralyzed from the neck down, I would still be responsible for having to earn a million dollars a year. That's basically what they said. I, if any year I earn less than a million dollars in a year, I'm committing a crime. That's fucking heinous. But that's the thing is that you say, do I get joy? But even despite this, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I still actually, you know, for the most part, enjoy living. I yeah. like life. You know, there, yeah. there have been times in the last few years where, you know, I, I could have gone either way. Sure. You know, uh, yeah, know. I bet. You know. Yeah. Well, Dave, I love you, and, uh, and my heart goes out to you, and I, and I, uh, and. Do you want to edit some of the early conversation in at the end? <laughs> yeah, we'll just, we're going to flip it all the way around. We're going to start. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's sad, but it's something that people can relate to, and, and, and there's a, in what I sense is that there, there's a hopelessness to the, the to the sense that you, you don't know when it's going to end, but you know, ultimately, it eventually will. And, yeah. and, and writing that out is the, is the hardest thing, and realizing that your recourse is limited, and that there's, there's a tremendous amount of of unfair behavior yeah coming at you and i can feel the the, the burden on your heart because i feel a little now i have a burden too because yeah. I'm, I'm that codependent but like you know <laughs> we, after we're done we can hang out <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah all right <laughs> thanks dave foley appreciate you coming thanks mark Well, that was a lovely talk. A little, a little heavy-hearted, but uh, it was a pleasure seeing Dave. And there was a lot of stuff I didn't know about the kids in the hall. And you know, I, my heart went out to him in a lot of ways. And and it was, uh, I, I love the guy. Thanks for listening to WTF. If you want to help out, obviously you've got the Pro Flowers option. You can go to proflowers.com and put WTF in the box there and get the deal. Get the dozen red roses with a free vase for twenty nine ninety nine, or you know, for if you're a what the fucker, you can upgrade to long stemmed and uh, roses and add the chocolates for ten bucks more, uh, and it's a guaranteed delivery on Valentine's Day. Also, go to wtfpod.com. Get on that mailing list. Kick in a few shekels. Go to wtfpodshop.com. Pick up a premium episode. And as always, uh, all the episodes are available to listen to on the new apps for iPhone iPod Touch, iPad, and Droid. And we're also working on making those available in a broader way. Hang tight for that. House of Comedy, Bloomington, Minnesota, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Love to see you there. I'll try to bring some shirts. I will bring some shirts. I'll bring some stick. I'll bring you stuff. Okay? You can bring me stuff, too. I love presents. Go easy on the baked goods. I'm getting fat. All right, enough about me. Well, then I would have to stop doing this show. <laughs> <laughs>